Well, welcome to another edition of Hank Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to bringing the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people directly to your earbuds. And uh, before we get started, I want to encourage all of you to rate and review the podcast. This gets the podcast out, circulates it around the world. So many reviews coming in. I read one this morning by Zippy, who says, I appreciate the depth and erudition that Hank brings to the conversation. Hank has insightful guests who are real game changers in the Christian faith. I really enjoy listening to Hank. Well, I think what he means is that he enjoys listening to my guests on Hank Unplugged. And today I have an incredible guest. His name is Marcellino D'Ambrosio, and he is a world-renowned commentator on spiritual matters. What I love about Marcellino is that he has a gift for taking the complex and making it accessible. He's affectionately known as Dr. Italy, and uh, he has many things to his credit, including being co-author of the, catch this, three million copy bestseller known as The Guide to the Passion. The book that I fell in love with, however, the book that I want to really get into on this podcast is a book titled When the Church Was Young, subtitled Voices of the Early Fathers. And this book is nothing short of gripping. In fact, it's very, very difficult to put down. When I first picked it up, I quite literally disrupted my schedule. I went out and talked to one of my researchers, and I kept reading him page after page after page. And so I love this book. It's one of those books you'll want to read again and again and again. What I am particularly intoxicated by, I suppose, is that this book underscores the common heritage of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. You know, long before the words Catholic and Orthodox and Evangelical were used as labels, the Church of the Fathers, well, they glorified in one faith, in one united body of Christ. And I think by understanding our common inheritance, the genuine body of Christ can move towards Will an answer to the Lord's high priestly prayer move towards unity around the essentials of the common faith, a faith that was hammered out in the councils, a faith that is codified in the creeds? Well, there's so much I'd like to say about Marcellino, but you'll find out about him in the podcast. Marcellino, it is just wonderful having you on Hank Unplugged. Hank, it's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure indeed. Thank you so much for inviting me. I love your book. And, uh, you know, as I was saying at the outside of the podcast, this is one of those books that takes us back to our common inheritance, a time when we didn't have the labels, a time in which the church was one. And I suppose we ought to start the podcast out by talking about how important unity is to Christ. Uh, Christ emphasized unity in his high priestly prayer. He prayed that we all might be as one so that the world might believe that you sent me. And so often when I talk about oneness within the body of Christ, it seems an impossible dream. And I suppose it's hard to get back to the time when the church was one, but I do think we have to work towards an answer to the Lord's high priestly prayer, an answer of unification around the essentials codified in the creeds and the councils. Well, if we love him, then we have to be dedicated to what he prayed for in his, his last evening of his life. And if we love the world, we need to be dedicated to unity because without unity, it's very hard for the church, for the world to recognize that Jesus was sent by the Father. This is what Jesus says. And, and so the stakes are really high. And uh, I think all too often we get pretty much bogged down in our own section of the vineyard and forget this big issue, this big picture. And I, I want to challenge everybody to just examine yourself, you know, everyone who's listening, how often do you pray for the unity of the body of Christ? And 
What have you done to build bridges? I think all of us can be bridge builders and all of us can be intercessors. All of us can be instruments to unity. And when you read the Fathers of the Church, you realize how passionate these men were about unity. Yeah, and we're going to get to that later on in the podcast. But to your point, I want to read a quote I just opened my book, Truth Matters, Life Matters More, The Unexpected Beauty of an Authentic Christian Life, and I have an epigraph by the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew, who says this, there is a direct link between the oneness of Christians after the image of the Trinity and the missionary dimension of the church. The church looks not inward, but outward. It exists not for the sake of itself, but for the sake of the world's salvation. The church, as a mystery of mutual Trinitarian love, is true to itself only if the circle of love is being constantly enlarged, only if new persons are continually being brought within it. Faith in the triune God signifies that we are each of us missionaries dedicated to the preaching of the gospel. And so here you have the patriarch in Istanbul or Constantinople, the patriarch talking about how important it is to see ourselves unified because unification of the church ultimately leads to the salvation of the world. Amen. And it really proceeds from who God is. God is three persons in one God. So unity of God, the interpersonal unity of God is the basis of all reality, and the church is is meant to manifest that. And and so it's such a countersign when we manifest squabbling and division and disunity. You know, it's really a blot. uh, It's a countersign. So anyway, it's, it's really, really important to be aware of the gift of unity, to preserve it, to enlarge it, to to strengthen it, to recover it. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out as we talk about unity, we're not talking about keeping the shell and throwing away the nut. We're talking about unity around the essentials of the Christian faith, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And that unity is manifested in the councils and the creeds. And I want to go through that, but let's start by sort of walking through your book, you offer this fabulous chronology of the early church fathers. In writing about the voices of the early church fathers, we're talking about a period that stretches from the voices of Jesus and the apostles to about the middle of the 8th century. So that's a long period of time, but you break that time frame into bite-sized chunks. And you start with the apostolic fathers. So you have the apostolic fathers, you have the apologists, and then you have the church fathers. And we'll get into all of that, but let's sort of zoom in on three apostolic fathers that you highlight in the book. These are fathers that I truly can say I've fallen in love with, not only through reading your book, but just through reading these fathers and knowing their testimonies. Some of them were alive at the time of the apostles. They had contact with them. They learned from them. And I want to begin with Clement of Rome. Clement of Rome died, I guess, somewhere towards the end of the first century, but his life lives on. And if we know about his life, his life can have a tremendous impact on our own lives. Absolutely. I've loved my visits to, actually in Rome, there's a church of St. Clement, that that commemorates this man and um the church is fascinating because it's it's a journey as you go from the ground floor of just middle ages down to the next level you have a fourth century church there from the time of the fathers like you know in the lifetime of, of people like athanasius you know but if you go deeper there's a first century house church that's probably the home of clement and so anyway, I, you know, I feel a real connection with him, not only through his letter, but, but through visiting that, that place in Rome. Very, very critical. One of, I, probably, you know, one of the earliest writings we have after the New Testament, probably his letter is about 95 AD. That's the best guess that we have for it. But it gives us a glimpse into challenges in the Church of Corinth, a church founded by Paul. But also it, it gives us an image into the, the Roman church and its culture and, and the way it the way it prays, uh, the way it lives. So 
it's an awesome gift. What's so cool about starting with Clement of Rome is that you and I were just talking about a commitment to unity. And this was the very thing that Clement of Rome was committed to. He said to divide the church is to do violence to Christ. So we learn a lot early on about a church that was unified and a church that was so dead set against becoming divisive and having divisions within it. And yet, in history, we find that that's exactly what happened. Yes, indeed. We see, actually, the, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter, is dealing with factions, and it's a call to unity in Christ. And um, so we see this letter by Clement was written probably about 40, 30 to 40 years later, and he's dealing with the same issue. Some younger people have overthrown the established leaders of the church called elders or, or bishops and um, had kind of taken over. And, and Clement writes from Roman. And he, he basically says, look, first of all, it's not about uh, exalting yourself. Christianity is about laying your life down. It's, it's being small. Humility is key. And uh, he sees at the root of disunity, pride and arrogance. So he calls them uh, firmly, but gently as an elder brother, he calls them to humility, to, to putting unity before their own ideas about what's best and what ought to happen. And uh, so I, I think it's it's pretty interesting to, to watch his, and he makes this really important point that leadership, charisms are given by the Spirit, sure, but leadership of the community is something that really you just can't make up. The apostles uh, ordained men, they set people aside, and those people made sure that there was an arrangement whereby they would hand on that authority, that teaching authority, that, that pastoral authority. So we have here a testimony to this idea of apostolic succession, an orderly succession, personal um, succession of leadership in the church, because the church is a family, and that family needs to have continuity. It's not reconstituted every new generation, so to speak. It has a heritage. Uh, so the very idea of tradition of teaching and the handing on of leadership is something that we see really clearly here in this first letter, uh, this letter of Clement to the Corinthians. You tell the most interesting story about how that letter, the letter not to the Corinthian church by the Apostle Paul, but by Clement of Rome, how that letter was part of Sunday worship for several hundred years in places like Alexandria. It was even regarded as part of the New Testament. It was lost to Christianity until the 17th century, and then it was found. Interesting story about how it was found. Yeah, it was part of a codex of the Bible, which means a, a big volume of all the books put together. And that was given to the king of England by an Eastern patriarch. And that had the letter of Clement in it. So this letter that had been forgotten was in Greek. And most of the church in the West had lost the ability to read Greek. You know, it, it, for many, many centuries, there was no one reading Greek. Everyone was reading only Latin. So anyway, this comes now it's original text and um, original in the sense that it's not the, the one that it's signed by Clement necessarily, but it's, it's the, uh, the Greek text. Anyway, it all of a sudden is discovered and it causes sensation. And I think it's important to point out that a lot of these apostolic fathers, we call them apostolic fathers because their lives overlapped the lives of the apostles. So it's possible. We're not sure, but it's possible that Clement sat at the feet of Peter and Paul when he was young. But in any event, we call them apostolic fathers, and they're really important link to the apostles. But we didn't have any of them at the time of the Protestant Reformation. None of them were accessible to us. We had nothing before written before the year 200 or so. And so it's so wonderful to have this now, to get a glimpse of what the early church really looked like and how government worked and how preaching worked. We see the way preaching happens in a certain way, because we see that the Old Testament is primarily what Clement uses, rather than um, some of the letters that, that we're used to from the New Testament. He's, we see the Old Testament as his primary source for teaching, and he gives it, of course, uh, a spirit-led Christian interpretation in light of the Messiah, in light of Jesus' coming. But uh, we see the importance of Old Testament scripture in the life of the church at the time of Clement. But we see so many beautiful things that, that we just didn't have at the time that so many church-dividing 
positions were being taken in the 16th century. So it seems to me it's a tremendous resource to have Clement and others to be able to go back and look at this together, Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox, and kind of re-examine the life of the early church. Yeah, when you read your section on Clement of Rome, it sort of reads like a fast-paced novel. It's just gripping. Ignatius of Antioch, this is one of my favorite apostolic fathers. I mean, the three that I love, all three of them cited in your book, Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch, and of course, Polycarp of Smyrna. But Ignatius of Antioch is particularly interesting for so many reasons. 300 years after Ignatius's death, Chrysostom described Ignatius as a soul seething with divine eros. And he's one of the apostolic fathers who gave his all for the cause of Christ. He was martyred. And the story of his martyrdom is a story that, again, I'm using the word gripping over and over again, but I think it's the operative word. It's a story that is so incredibly gripping, particularly when he says that he doesn't want the early church to interfere with his martyrdom. He says, I'm voluntarily dying for God. If that is, you don't interfere, I plead with you. Do not do to me an unseasonable kindness. Let me be fodder for wild beasts. That is how I get to God. I am God's wheat. I'm being ground by the teeth of wild beasts to make a pure loaf for Christ. And so here you have a man who marches literally to his own martyrdom and doesn't want anybody to interfere. In the process, however, he's left us a legacy. He certainly has. You know, for those who don't know the story, first of all, persecution in the early Roman Empire uh, was a sporadic thing. It wasn't an empire-wide thing for, for quite a while. So a, a persecution broke out in Antioch. He's captured. The bishop is captured. He's too big of a fish to die just for the amusement of the locals. So he's sent to Rome to die at the pleasure of the emperor. So he's marched in, chained to a squad of 10 soldiers who abused him and were very crass and crude and rough. But he had to walk all the way from what's now the border of Lebanon and Turkey. He had to walk all the way um, west and north to the far northwestern section of Turkey, ancient Troy, where he's put on a boat and he eventually makes his way to Rome. But while he's walking through Turkey, the western coast of what's now Turkey, that's where there are some amazing Christian communities that are the seven churches of Revelation. You have Smyrna and you have Ephesus and, and many others. So delegations from those churches come to visit him. Uh, there's no persecution going on there at that time. So they, they're free to come visit him. And um, they kiss his change. He blesses them. And then he writes letters back to the whole church that they represented. Um, and he writes seven letters, one to Rome ahead of where he's going, but uh, six to the local churches. And it's his last shot to give, give some teaching to these people and to fight against heresy that is besetting them to exhort them to holiness, which is his own passion, discipleship. So it's kind of a beautiful window into the soul of of an early bishop and a martyr. And he just happens to be the second bishop in succession to Peter, Paul, and Barnabas in Antioch. So pretty important link to the apostolic tradition. So often when we talk about holy tradition, there's a lot of pushback within the body of Christ. And I think it's important to maybe at this point talk about the significance of holy tradition, because so often in my own career as host of the Bible Answer Man broadcast, I've made exegetical arguments from the Bible for why we worship on Sunday as opposed to worshiping on Saturday. And you'll have people from the Seventh-day Adventist group or others that will push back on this and say that worshiping on Sunday is taking the mark of the beast. And yet you don't have to just make an exegetical argument. If you understand holy tradition, if you understand voices from the early church, you get to make an argument from holy tradition because you have the practices of the early church being passed on 
from the apostolic fathers, through the apologists, through the holy fathers of the church, to every Eucharistic assembly throughout the land. And therefore, we have knowledge about how the early church operated, and that knowledge informs us as well with respect to why we worship on the first day of the week in honor of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. I think it's just really important for people to understand that the Lord Jesus doesn't seem to have written anything, and uh, you know, except in the sand. And for three years, what was he doing? He was living with the disciples. They were seeing things that you, they're hard to put into writing, actually. I mean, they saw expression on his face. They heard the tone in his voice. They, they watched things that they picked up by, in a certain way, osmosis. They kind of absorbed the impression of who Jesus was and what he did. And it's certainly they remembered his words, which many of which are now recorded in the Gospels. And certainly their own teaching was modeled on his and flowed from his. But interestingly enough, we don't have anything from the first disciples, uh, the eyewitnesses, for 20 years or so after the resurrection. What were they doing? They were doing the same thing as Jesus did. They lived with people. And the sacred tradition really is the passing on in real life of that whole reality, all that, that Jesus, the apostles, the church uh, said and did and were. It's kind of like that, that's that's passed on, and, it, and it's bigger than and prior to the New Testament writings. And it was seen as a norm. In fact, in Clement, he talks as he's, he's exhorting the people of Corinth to end the rebellion against the, the rightly appointed presbyters and bishops. He, he is telling them that they need to submit to the rule, and the, the word rule is canon, of our sacred tradition which is fascinating. Even before the New Testament writings are assembled together into a canon or a rule, you see Clement, this, this one who is a successor of Peter and Paul in Rome, he is saying, you know, you have to submit to the rule of the life that's been passed on. That's what tradition means, what's been handed over, that sacred trust that's been handed over. And that's what really tradition is. It's not just a few little extraneous practices. It's the whole life of the church from which the New Testament writings spring and against which the New Testament writings must be interpreted. If you don't interpret the writings of the New Testament against the backdrop of the whole tradition of the church, you end up making all sorts of crazy errors. So um, it's important to understand that the New Testament scriptures flow from the apostolic tradition and they're constantly accompanied by that tradition, which gives us the lens, the proper lens, with which to view and understand the New Testament writings. Yeah, and the church passes that on. And Paul talks about the church in Scripture as the ground and pillar of truth. And I think that's an important maxim for Christians to grasp hold of. It's the church that is the ground and pillar of of truth. It is the church that is the center of the universe. It is the church that is the God-ordained vehicle through which these truths are propagated and passed on. Absolutely. And it was the church that uh, really all the writers of the New Testament are members of that church, and they speak not only for themselves, but they give voice to that church and, and the church's tradition. And it was the church that discerned which writings that bore names of apostles were authentic and were to be regarded as inspired scripture and read in the Eucharistic assembly. So without the church, you don't have the scriptures or the Bible. So you can't really pit tradition against Bible and Bible against tradition. They're, they really stand or fall together. You know, what's interesting, as you mentioned early on, that when Clement was talking about the scriptures, he was talking about the Old Testament scriptures. And I think it's noteworthy that the early church, the church that we're talking about right now, is a church that didn't have the Bible as codified today, at least with respect to the New Testament, the 27 books of the canon. That wasn't codified as a canon till somewhere in the 4th century, late 4th century, 367, I think it was, by Athanasius. So we have this sense that people always had the Bible, but they didn't. And as we noted early on, 
even the letter of Clement was codified with a canon read for many centuries within the church, but now we don't have it as part of the canon. But this is a decision that was made based on principles, a determination made within the corporate council of the church. Yes, I think it's important too uh, to realize that the vehicle for the development of the New Testament canon was the liturgy of the apostolic churches. It was there that people heard the scriptures. You know, we have to keep in mind there's no printing press. Books are expensive. Uh, Books are rare. Actually, the technology to have a bound Bible as we know it, that technology really wasn't developed till the fourth century. So you had scrolls, individual scrolls, and you had individual folios of, of maybe eight pages of a booklet as we might know it. And those collections were kept largely in the church and read in public worship. So that's how people were exposed to the scriptures. And what was read in worship was a discernment of the church. So, you know, Clement's letter was read for a while. After a while, the majority felt like Clement's letter is magnificent, but we're not going to read it in the liturgy because Clement wasn't an apostle. So, uh, but it was very, very important. And this is how the New Testament canon developed. What is read in the liturgy of the apostolic churches And then eventually that gets codified in local councils like the Council of Carthage, the the, the letter of Athanasius um, that lists books that are by him. But they're they're books that are read in the liturgy of the Church of Alexandria. So the the liturgy of the Church itself is the bearer and the primary vehicle of, of this tradition that gives us the canon of Scripture. I think that's one of the things that we need to understand in the New Testament. The, there is one page that's definitely not inspired, and that is the table of contents. That didn't drop from heaven. That wasn't written by an apostle, but that is discerned by the church's tradition. And so all of us who have a Bible and look at that table of contents and accept the books in the Old and New Testament are really relying on the tradition of the church that's passed on and by the fathers of the church in a very special way. Maybe one more thing we ought to say about Ignatius of Antioch first, that he is Ignatius of Antioch. This was where Christians were first called Christians. But uh, more to the point, Ignatius makes an argument for the Eucharist, you know, for the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And I love the argument. It's codified in your book. But he's asserting that just as the historical body of Jesus was not a mere phantasm, neither is the Eucharist an empty symbol. Rather, this is the real body. This is the pure body, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And this was shrouded in mystery. How this could be, no one could tell, just as we cannot fully explain how Christ could be one person with two natures. So we can't fully explain how Christ could be really present. But that was a central teaching of the church. The church was energized by the Eucharist. They were energized not by biological power, but zoetic energy. The church is energized by a force that is in them, not of them. And by that, they turn a world right side up. Absolutely. You can't miss it when you read the fathers, and starting with Clement and Ignatius. And by the way, you know, Ignatius is very early. We're talking, we don't know the exact date of his letters, but somewhere between 110 and 117. So that's really early. It's only 15 years, maybe after the last New Testament book, which we're, we're guessing 20 years at the most. So it's, it's really um, amazing. But you see the centrality of the Eucharist, as well as the centrality of Sunday. You know, as you mentioned earlier, when we talked about Sunday worship, Ignatius says very clearly that it was the apostles who taught us to worship on the Lord's Day. So this is, again, he's a witness to apostolic tradition. Why do we celebrate on Sunday? Because the resurrection begins a new creation. Sabbath is wonderful. It's the commemoration of the the first creation and God's resting. But God does a new work on the eighth day in the resurrection. So this is a very deliberate teaching of the apostles. That's why we find it in all the apostolic churches, this Sunday worship. But we also find it's Eucharistic worship, that it is what Jesus did at the Last Supper, done again. And, And the belief here is very clear. Just as Jesus was truly incarnate, 
the immaterial, invisible God comes to us visibly through the humanity of Christ, so the Eucharist really is his tangible, visible presence of his body and blood. And so, you know, he doesn't try to explain it. You're right, Hank. He doesn't try to explain it. He, he just witnesses to the centrality of it. And he basically says that people, the people who are not doing the Eucharist and, and refraining from it are those who are uncomfortable with the humanity of Christ and don't believe in it. They don't believe that Jesus was truly man. So there's a beautiful link here, very clear link in the early church between uh, believing in the reality of the sacraments and the reality of Christ's humanity. They're linked. The incarnation is linked to the reality of the Eucharist and the sacraments. One of my all-time favorite apostolic fathers, the one I've quoted most over the years, is Polycarp of Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna, as you alluded to earlier, is one of the seven churches of the apocalypse. And by the way, this is parenthetical, but I think all of the Bible was completed before AD 70. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. I've done a lot of work on that particular subject. But I think that if, in fact, these letters were written after, or anything was written after AD 70, it would most certainly have mentioned the most apocalyptic event in church history, which was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. But that's another story. But Polycarp of Smyrna was a disciple of John. He was a colleague to Ignatius. And there were parallels between his martyrdom and that of Christ. And I tell you, so often I think about what he said, it's emblazoned on the canvas of my consciousness, 80 and six years have I served him, will I now deny the Lord that saved me? And so he too was, like Ignatius, martyred for the faith. It's really a touching story, isn't it? I mean, I love his letter, but I I, I love uh, the, the, the account of his martyrdom. And it is so important important to see that the martyrs died not because they were just loyal to an idea or an ideology, but it was union with Christ. They, they wanted to share in his sufferings. We see that in Ignatius. We see it in Polycarp. And so the martyr imitates Christ and wants to be conformed to Christ in every way. And that's clear. Even the, It's just ironic here that uh, even the person's name, uh, there's a Herod who happens to be involved in this story, uh, who's a police chief or something. And so it's it's really uh, it, so much his his forgiveness of the crowd that it calls for his death, his the nobility of his prayer, which sounds a lot like a Eucharistic prayer. It's just a beautiful thing, and and it, it shows us actually also where the church calendar of saints comes from. This martyrdom, which took place around 155 AD, the one who writes the story, a member of the church who witnessed this event, says that every year the faithful gather at the place where his ashes are kept to celebrate his day of death as a birthday, a birthday into eternal life. So this is really uh, where the calendar comes from. And it's also where the idea comes from that the early Christians were hiding out in the catacombs. They didn't celebrate necessarily Sunday worship there, but they celebrated the feasts of the martyrs at their graveside, which in Rome would have been in in catacombs. So it just shows you how central and important the the love of the the martyrs, the commemoration of the martyrs are. And and there's no real contest between honoring the martyrs and worshiping Jesus. They didn't confuse the two. They saw the two as being interrelated. To that point, the point of bringing the ashes, elaborate on the significance of relics and the practice of bringing the remains of martyrs into churches. A lot of people find that to be very, very strange in the modern world. But in the ancient world, this was not strange at all because we believe that we are indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit. So our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, and therefore the bones of our bodies are impacted by the dunamis of God. And those relics are very, very significant, were held to be significant in the ancient church, and I think ought to be in the modern church as well. Absolutely. It was so important. You know, we we do have to just keep in mind we're products of our own culture and death 
And those who have died, you know, are sequestered far away from us. Uh, you know, we, we very seldom see them in the cemeteries or go there, um, you know, and it, we live in a, in a society that is, is very afraid to confront the issue of death and, and remember the dead. Uh, but that wasn't the way it was even in secular society of the ancient world. In Rome, you know, in the time of the first and second century, people had little houses. Uh, they, in, the graveyards were above ground. Uh, this is St. Peter's is built over one. And families would go and visit and have meals in commemoration of the dead. So that was the general culture. Well, Christians had much more reason to feel a sense of unity with those who are deceased because of the unity of the body of Christ. And as you said, that, that the body of the martyr w was indwelt by the spirit and was sacred. So first of all, Christians went to the graves in, you know, originally in the first century in ab above ground cities of the dead. And then in the second and third century, when they changed the burial method and did it below ground, they went into the catacombs and they actually used the grave as an altar. So uh, when they came out of the catacombs, they took relics of the saints and put them in the altars. And that, that's kind of, you know, where that practice comes from. But it's really uh, uh, the mystery of the communion of saints and the honoring of those in whom Christ's Holy Spirit dwells. That's where the reverence to the relics of the saints comes from. And actually, you know, you can even see in the Old Testament a sense of the spiritual power of God passing through things, you know, like, uh, for example— Elijah's body. Somebody throws a dead body into the grave of Elijah because there's a raid happening, and uh, that person comes back to life. So, you know, the cloak of Elijah, the, the bones of Elisha, the staff of Moses, you know, there's a way in which these things are made holy by the power of God passing through them. Yeah, absolutely. You devote a good bit of time in your book to the Didache. And I want to talk about that a little bit and have you elaborate, because here you have an early church catechism and also a document that gives us a sense of church order or how church took place. And therefore, we have an early prototype for how we ought to do church today. Absolutely. It's really fascinating um, how this document, again, it was lost for a long time. It was found only in the 19th century and identified for what it was. And since uh, it caused a great sensation when it was found, but fascinating, this is a testimony to tradition and to humility in the church. The author does not name himself. And, and that's because he's really passing on something that doesn't come from him. He's passing on the church's tradition, the teaching of the 12 apostles. And uh, so he passes on really how early Christians were formed before baptism. And we see the, the, really the, the earliest catechism that follows the Ten Commandments. And by the way, it's the first explicit, very, very clear and explicit uh, prohibition of abortion and contraception as being against the Fifth Commandment. But then he passes on into explaining how Christian worship ought to take place. And uh, he talks about baptism. And you see here... And this document probably, as we have it now, it's probably from about 125 A.D., that's the best guess, but it stitches together two earlier documents that are most probably first century documents, so contemporaneous, like possibly with New Testament writings. But uh, we see the centrality of the Eucharist, and we see in baptism how baptism was done, yes, ideally in the leaving water and by immersion, but if that wasn't possible, over pouring three times uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see that the current way the Church baptizes today at, in East and West, the Trinitarian Christian churches, you know, that has its roots right back in the way early Christians baptized in, in the late first century. So it's a pretty amazing document, really. Yeah, and you have instructions on fasting, also praying three times a day. I think that's particularly interesting because what you have here is an imitation, as it were, of what the Jews did. The Jews exactly. prayed the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And instead of praying the Shema, we now pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. We have this pattern, and during the coronavirus pandemic, this was one of the calls that I had to churches all over the world 
to pray three times a day, just as the early church did, morning, noon, and night. Pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. And the beauty of it is we are able to call God our Father something that was unthinkable to the Jewish community. They weren't even able to pronounce the name of God, much less address him as Father. And this is precisely what Jesus tells us to do because we've been adopted, co-heirs, adopted into the family of God. Yes, it is so central. It is so absolutely central to the uniqueness of our relationship with God taught to us by the Savior himself, calling God Father. So it was clear that the Our Father that we find in Matthew and Luke's gospel was the central prayer of Christians, and it did replace that Shema, and it was like the brand. It identified uh, and helped to distinguish Christians from um, Jews who did not accept Christ. And so did the fast days. You know, Jews, it seems that they fasted on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and uh, it says in the day, okay, we fast, not like the hypocrites, but we fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. So we see actually the Wednesday and Friday penitential days, which is still the Christian East still observes these days penitentially. And, and the West at least has a memory uh, in the Latin church has a memory of, of Friday being a penitential day all throughout the year. But this this goes really back to the first century. Yeah, absolutely. And then also the emphasis that is placed in the Eucharist is central to the worship service. I want to move from the Apostolic Fathers to the Apologists, the Christian Research Institute. I've been president here for something like 35 years. We're called an apologetic ministry. We're always ready to give an answer, a reason for the faith that lies within us with gentleness and with respect. And when we think about apologetics, so often people say, well, what are you apologizing for? But denotatively, <laughs> we're talking about a defense of the faith against Christian heretics, against Jewish critics, against pagan persecutors. And this is precisely what a group of men did who followed in the train of the Apostolic Fathers. And one of the most noteworthy and early of these apologists was Justin Martyr, his ultimate act of witness which you have codified in the book, is actually worth reading. I don't know if you want to read it. I mean, I, I just think it's fantastic, or maybe you can summarize it. But here it, you have the ultimate act of witness where he's going to die or he's going to give his life, he's going to be beheaded, he's going to be martyred, and he doesn't shy away from martyrdom or death. Rather, he gives an apology for the faith, a defense of the faith. He's rather bold, isn't he? We have... Somebody recorded his dialogue with the prefect, Rusticus, and so we have that. It's a precious thing to have from around the year 166 AD, but he's pretty strong. He's pretty strong. Absolutely. You know, he doesn't just think. He doesn't just believe. He knows that his God is the true God and that Jesus is, is the true Savior. And he says, we ask nothing better than to suffer for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and so to be saved. If we do this, we can stand confidently and quietly before the fearful judgment seat of that same God and Savior, when in accordance with divine ordering, all this world will pass away. So uh, he, he doesn't mince his words. And I, I just want to say that he did something very courageous. It was a capital offense to profess Christianity. So Christian meetings and liturgy were secret. But Justin moved to Rome and opened his home as a public seminar place where anyone could come and learn about the Christian faith. And it was that ultimately that led to his capture, his denunciation from another philosopher who was jealous of him, and he ends up being martyred. But he's an absolutely courageous man. Another great apologist for the faith, following on the footsteps of the Apostolic Fathers, Irenaeus. He writes a book titled Against Heresies, and he had a connection with Polycarp. Polycarp, of course, a disciple of John, and Irenaeus may have heard Polycarp actually speak. So you have here a man who makes a sterling defense against Gnosticism, and I was hoping that you could spend just a few moments unpacking Gnosticism for people who don't have a handle on what that is. Sure. 
Well, we have an idea of the New Age movement now that kind of blends things, exotic ideas from the East together maybe with some Christian ideas. And uh, it may sound or look spiritual or Christian, but ends up, as you probe it, you know, you realize it's not at all Christianity. And so that kind of a movement happened in the second century. And it's a movement that came from the East, and it played on the fact that people really felt the need of salvation. And the idea really of salvation in the Gnostic movement was we got to get away from this material world and the material of the human body. You know, yeah, you know, this all this gross uh, <laughs> flesh that we carry around and birth and death and, you know, having babies and and eating and all these things are kind of disgusting. And we need to try to get away from that into the spiritual realms. And the idea was, you know, a few of us really did descend from the spiritual realm. When we got trapped in these bodies, we got to find our way back to the pure spiritual realm. And there needs to be a, someone who comes from that realm to teach us. So Christian Gnostics took Jesus as that figure. And he really wasn't God made flesh. He was God like uh, an angel appearing as a phantasm and teaching us not about, he didn't die for us. No, he came to teach us uh, certain passwords and secret things that will help us navigate our way after we leave this body into the celestial sphere. It was really kind of crazy stuff. And they basically, the, the Christian Gnostics said, well, yeah, it's not in those books that you think came from the apostles. We have our secret tradition. Jesus knew that most people couldn't handle this stuff, so he just told a few of choice disciples, and we have that tradition. And that's fascinating, because the appeal of the Gnostics was to a secret tradition. And you'd think that Irenaeus would fight them by saying, no, Scripture alone, no secret tradition. But instead, he says, no, we have the true apostolic tradition, because Jesus, if he's going to teach anything, is going to teach his disciples who were closest to him. And we know all the churches they founded. And the men who are now bishops in those churches descend in a continuous line. They go right back to those apostles. And none of them know anything about any of this nonsense. So clearly, we have the truth about Jesus because we have the authentic tradition. So it's very important to see the importance of tradition in the apologetics of the early church in trying to determine what is authentic Christianity. And remember, by this time, there's not a, a New Testament codified in a, you know, in a book like we have it now in a volume. But interestingly enough, we also find in Irenaeus, he's the first writer in which we find virtually every book of the New Testament that we now have as cited and used, with the exception, I think, of 2nd and 3rd John and maybe the letter of Jude. Uh, I'm just speaking from memory now. I think I have it in my book. But um, so he's very, very important witness to the development of what we now call the New Testament canon, but at the same time, the theology of tradition and apostolic succession. Yeah, I think that's beautifully said, because for Irenaeus, the sacred commission of the apostolic fathers was the proper transmission of apostolic tradition from one generation to the next, from the holy fathers onward to the Eucharistic assembly of every local church in every successive generation. And what I got out of Irenaeus and even out of reading your book is that holy tradition of apostolic fathers is not an independent instance. It was not a complementary source of faith. Ecclesiastical understanding couldn't add anything to the scripture, but it was the only means to ascertain, to disclose the true meaning of scripture. And so tradition was the authentic interpretation of scripture. And in that sense, it was coextensive with scripture. Tradition was actually scripture rightly understood. And this is one of the things that Irenaeus does. He's, as you said earlier, not making a false dichotomy between holy tradition and scripture, but seeing the coextensive link between the two. Absolutely. Indeed. Yes. And this is also very important, again, that tradition helps us discern which books are authentic and contain the apostolic faith. Because remember, there was a gospel of Thomas, and there were actually two, an infancy gospel of Thomas and a gospel of Thomas that was lost, that is mentioned by Irenaeus, but it was dug up in 1940 
647 in Egypt, the Nag Hammadi find. And so, you know, that got, who's to say that that's not from Thomas? Well, you know, it, it's pretty simple. None of the apostolic churches knew about this. It doesn't jive with the faith. It does not jive with the tradition, the canon of tradition, which makes the cross the central thing in the whole story of Jesus. The Gospel of Thomas by the Gnostics is just this collection of sayings. There's no cross. <laughs> so, so anyway, but, but Irenaeus kind of helps us understand that it's what books are really in the New Testament based on the rule of tradition. This couldn't have been from Thomas because it doesn't have the, the canon of, of tradition, sacred tradition. It doesn't have the cross in it, and it's never been read in any apostolic, uh, any of the, of the churches. So uh, tradition is very, very important for ascertaining what are authentic and legitimate books that were inspired by the Holy Spirit and do go back to apostolic times and teaching. One other thing I think we ought to say about Irenaeus is that he was the first to systematize the exchange formula of salvation. You know, the Word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, who did through his transcendent love become what we are, that he might bring us to be even what he is himself. So, you know, the whole early church notion that Christ his kenosis becomes our theosis, his emptying becomes our filling. And so early on in church history, you have what Athanasius so memorably codified as God became man so that man might become God, not in terms of the essence of God, but in terms of participating in the energies of God. Yes, as it says in, in the letter of Peter, Second Peter 1, you know, they were called to, to be sharers in the divine nature. That idea is very, very clear and developed beautifully in Irenaeus, the nobility and the restoration of humanity. You know, God, the Lord didn't just come that we be forgiven and that our sins be wiped off God's record book, but he came to really change us beginning even now um, in, in this life. So I think that's really critical and you see it beautifully expressed in Irenaeus. And you're right, Irenaeus is the first one really to try to give a coherent explanation of the entire faith. So he's kind of uh, the proto-systematic theologian in a certain way um, in his exposition. His, his idea was, you know, that the best way to fight Gnosticism is to give, give the antidote, to really lay out the truth in its fullness. Uh, and I love him for that. Yeah, and his defense against Gnosticism didn't go unheeded because not long after Against Heresies was written, Gnosticism actually faded from the picture. It really did. It really did. So we owe him, Irenaeus, a great debt, um, a great debt of gratitude. And it's, I think he's beautiful to read. And on my website, I have lots of excerpts from Irenaeus, just bite-sized little excerpts that are some of his gems. I just love to share them with people. Of course, Gnosticism has been resurrected again and again. One of the latest permutations was Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, which resurrects the claim of a secret tradition that is earlier and more faithful than the New Testament scripture. I wrote a book with a co-author called The Da Vinci Code, Fact or Fiction. And Dr. Paul Meyer, a professor of ancient history, he and I collaborated, wrote a book together, and that was, again, against a newer permutation of the Gnostic heresy. So these kinds of heresies, you think they're eradicated, but like a virus, they reappear. That's <laughs> right. Mutated. They keep coming back. As we hear Kohelis say, there's nothing new under the sun. That's kind of the way uh, heresies are. Clement of Alexandria. I would be remiss if we didn't spend any time on this great apologist. And what I think is cool about Clement of Alexandria, we're just talking about Gnostics. And a point you make in the book is that words are not univocal, they're equivocal. They take on the meaning that the context allows them to have. And this is one of the things that Clement of Alexandria did. He talked about the true Gnostic or the Christian Gnostic. So he uses the language of Gnosticism, but he puts it within a proper context. And he points out that the heretical Gnostics were elitists, they kept their knowledge a secret, but the true Gnostic shares that truth with anyone and with everyone. Absolutely. It's so beautiful to see his idea is, is we're not just called to just believe in Christ, we're called to 
enter into a deeper and deeper penetration of the truth of who Jesus is. So we're called to be growing. I love his idea of the Christian life. Uh, it's not like, you know, you get saved and that's it. And then you, you know, try to stay out of trouble until you die and go to heaven. It's a dynamic progression where you're learning more and more, you're entering more fully. You find this in Paul for sure. You know, and when Paul says, I want to know Jesus Christ and the power flowing from his resurrection, likewise, to know how to share in his suffering by being formed into the pattern of his death. He says that in Philippians. Well, you know, that means that, you know, Paul said that I want to know Jesus Christ. Well, don't you know him already, Paul? You're an apostle. But for Paul, he never knew the Lord enough. He discovered anew every day, deeper insights into who Jesus was. And that wasn't just a head knowledge. That was experiential knowledge. And so I think that's what we find in Clement, you know, and he's teaching this, and it's amazing. He's the teacher of the new Christians, and it's fascinating. This school of Alexandria, this catechetical school that was late second century, they really wanted to equip the Christians of that town not just to stay out of trouble again and be decent people, and not even just personally to grow in holiness and knowledge, but to be equipped all to be apologists and evangelists. And that's the way they were educating the people. I mean, Clement's teaching, if you read Clement, he's teaching ordinary Christians. So the idea of the ordinary Christian life was pretty exalted in Alexandria. Every Christian is called to grow in holiness and to grow in the ability to share the gospel with everyone, even the most sophisticated of the people in the culture. And Alexandria was a very sophisticated place. It had an incredible library. Uh, And it was the center of actually the Gnostic movement. So, um, you know, here we we find Christians not just sheltering and circling wagons and trying to keep the world out and being uncontaminated by the world. They were aggressively going out and sharing the gospel. And um, in 202, the first, while Clement was in charge of the Alexandrian school there, it was the first empire-wide edict against Christianity. And the, the edict forbade not believing in Christ, not worshiping Christ, but in evangelizing, in sharing Christ with others. And you know what? The Christians would not comply. And so, uh, you know, there were a lot of martyrdoms in 202 because the Christians of Alexandria had been trained that sharing the gospel is key. It's part and parcel of living for Christ. You cannot not do that. You can't just practice your religion and not evangelize. That's part of our faith. Yes, yes. Let me pause for just a moment for everyone listening in. I want to say we've gone through a lot of names here, but each one of those names in the book becomes a gripping, fast-paced story. It's like you're reading a novel. I quite literally can tell you that I couldn't put the book down. And for that reason, I want to make it available to everyone listening to me right now. The book available for those who support the Ministry of the Christian Research Institute. You can get your copy by simply writing me at box 8500 Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. You can also order a copy on the web at equip.org, E-Q-U-I-P dot org. Again, available for those who support the ministry. We'll send you a copy. I want to move on to Origen. Origen is an incredible father of the faith, and uh, I want to spend a little time here because here's a student of Clement of Alexandria, who was a systematic theologian who coined Greek phrases and terms that we use today. So oftentimes on the Bible and Spend broadcast, I use the phrase theanthropos. I define it, of course, by saying the God-man or homoousius. He also, by the way, popularized the term mother of God or God-bearer or theotokos. That term was used before, but he popularized it. So here you have an apologist who is so important, coining words and phrases that are part of our vocabulary today. He is just an amazing character, and I have to say he's one of my great inspirations from this era. I'm a lay theologian, and so I identify a lot with him, who for most of his life was a lay teacher. He was later ordained. He was such a powerful preacher that it just the, the bishops around Caesarea and the Holy Land just wanted him to preach, and uh, he couldn't legally preach if he wasn't ordained, so they ordained him because they wanted to hear his teaching. But uh, he was just so passionate about the Lord. He saw his dad dragged off in the persecution I just mentioned in 202 AD 
um, his dad was dragged off for refusing to stop evangelizing. And um, Origen wanted to run after him and to die with his father. And his mother was smart, knowing he was modest. He was sleeping, woke up in his underwear, and she hid his clothes to stop him from running out on the street after his father. But he was just so passionate. He wrote to his dad and said, Dad, don't give in. You know, be faithful to Jesus. And his dad did die as a martyr. And at that point, Origen just decided he was going to live as sacrificially as he possibly could. He lived a very ascetic life. He took the, the counsel of, of Jesus' counsel in Matthew 19 to become a eunuch for the kingdom of God. He became single for the Lord. He, he dedicated himself to prayer, fasting, and teaching for the rest of his life. Uh, ended up suffering. He wasn't martyred, but he was tortured for the faith and died as a confessor after being so terribly weakened by that torture. So uh, just an amazing character. The amount that he wrote is just mind-boggling, kind of like St. Augustine, you know, probably almost impossible for anybody to, to keep up with Origen and, and actually read all that he wrote. And even beyond everything that he wrote, I think what's so interesting about Origen is he didn't merely want to inform us, he wanted to transform us, because this was the pattern of Christ. Christ meets us in the Word of God, not just to give us a bunch of information, but to transform our lives, to bring us into the fellowship of the Holy Trinity. I love the fact that he didn't separate intellectual knowledge from that transformative knowledge of acquaintance with God. I love the way he talks about inspiration. You know, a lot of times Christians think about inspiration as the Holy Spirit whispering in the ear of the evangelist, and that's the moment of inspiration. And so the words are authoritative. But I love the fact that Origen sees the Bible as a temple, and the Holy Spirit lives in that temple. So it's not just the author that was inspired back in the first century. The words are inbreathed. They contain the Spirit. And when we approach them in faith, the Spirit can transform us. And that's his, he, he's a great Bible scholar who did all the Hebrew. He studied Hebrew. He lined up different Greek versions and Hebrew versions to establish the best text. So he did a lot of technical, gritty work. But when, when push came to shove, you know, Scripture primarily is a place to meet God and to be transformed. That was his approach to Scripture. What's so cool about your book as well, there's so many things I love about your book. You're just an incredible writer, by the way. But what I love is if you read the Old Testament, you read the patriarchs, they're never airbrushed. They're presented with all their warts and moles and wrinkles. They're realistically presented to us. And you do the same thing in your book. You present origin as a genius on the one hand, but you also point out that there was chaff mixed with the wheat of origin's genius. In other words, we have a mixed bag here, and you're honest enough to tell that part of the story. Oh, of course, yeah. In fact, uh, people were, in the history of the church were so aware of the chaff that they dismissed the wheat. And so what we got to do is go back and recover that wheat and not discard it because there's chaff. There's some allegories that get kind of wild with origin, and there are also some doctrines. Now, you, we just have to keep in mind there were no ecumenical councils yet. We didn't have the Nicene Creed yet in the time of origin. So we had the scriptures, we had the liturgy, we had the apostolic tradition, but lots of things hadn't been explained yet. And origin was a pioneer. He was really an explorer, and that was part of his role. And uh, explorers and pioneers sometimes get off on the wrong track, and origin did. And so there were some things that he thought. Uh, one of the things, just keep in mind, he always said, I'm in complete submission of course, to the Lord, but also to the church. I'm a man of the church. And if there's anything I ever say that the church says is wrong, don't listen to me. Listen to the church. So he has some beautiful quotes along those lines. He's a very humble man. But he, in that time when he was doing exploration, he you know, went in places that the church later said, no, that's not the, really the right place to go. Um, like, you know, that, that at the end, all will be saved, including the demons, you know. So there's certain kinds of things that we don't follow origin on. But what the church has retained of origin's thought is priceless. And you can find it in the Eastern Fathers. You can find it in the Western Fathers. You know, we just went through, uh, just before recording this podcast, we went through Holy Week. And the water and the blood that flowed from Christ's side, you see in that, uh, the, all the fathers, 
like Chrysostom say, you know, that, that we see there Eucharist and baptism from which the church is born and takes nourishment. Well, the first one that we have who sees that and writes that in the tradition uh, that is is origin. Uh, he could have received that from apostolic tradition, or it could have been an insight that he had that everyone said after him, yes, absolutely, that's right. We're not sure. But he's a very important influencer of all the fathers, East and West, Augustine, Chrysostom, Nyssa, just so many of the great fathers owe so much to Origen, and therefore we owe so much to him as well. Another great apologist in the early church was Tertullian. Whenever I say Tertullian, I think about Trinity, because he is the one who coined that Latin term, Trinity, a term we use over and over again in modern vernacular within the church. And yet this is a term that codifies what is taught in Scripture, not a term that we find in Scripture. Exactly. And that's part of what the fathers of the church do, is they pass on the apostolic tradition, but they also help clarify it. They also help give us structure, concepts, words to really express it better. And so uh, we get this word Trinitas that explains three persons in one God. And, and that classic kind of definition we find in Tertullian, and in the same way, we find the, the beautiful expression that Christ is one person in two natures, human and divine. These two formulae become classic in Christian orthodoxy, both East and West, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church and Protestants who are Trinitarian. You know, all we have this in common, and we have uh, Tertullian in large part to thank for expressing it with this kind of conciseness and clarity. What do you make of Tertullian's fall from grace, as it were? <laughs> well, you talked about not sugarcoating the story, you know, and, and Tertullian's a good example of genius. You know, I think that there are gifts called charisms that the Holy Spirit gives to people, and um, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, there's no faults when it comes to holiness, you know. And I think the problem with Tertullian, he is a bit arrogant, and <laughs> he's a bit proud, and um, he ends up getting involved with a rigorous sect called the Montanists. And part of what they were about was they were very critical of church authority for being too soft on people, too soft on sinners. And unfortunately, this is the direction that um, Tertullian goes in in the later years of his life, very rigorous about sin, about forgiveness, about many things having to do with pleasure and sexuality. He just goes off with this movement that was popular in the latter part of the second century. So that's kind of sad, but it doesn't invalidate the great contributions that he makes through his writings, his earlier writings. And even actually after he starts veering off in some of these other areas, still his Christology and his Trinitarian theology was very important, very good. So again, you know, it, I love the fact that we are not obliged, we are Christians, as Catholics, as Orthodox, as Protestant Christians, as Evangelical Christians, um, you know, we're not beholden to one person except to Jesus Christ. And, and so, you know, even though in the Orthodox and Catholic Church we have, and, and the Protestants as well, we have heroes and, and saints, you know, we don't follow any person completely other than Jesus. And uh, I would say in the Fathers of the Church, it's what they agree on together that witnesses to the apostolic tradition, and there, there seem to be authoritative and infallible but, you know, individually, they, they can go off a little bit here and there, and most of them did, other than Gregory of Nazianzus, the Gregory the theologian. He's one that, that, that never seems to have really gone off in any of his writing. But others do. But the problem is, you know, in many cases, a lot of times when they do go off, it's only later that the Church clarifies the position. Unfortunately, with Tertullian, unlike Origen, he didn't have the humility that Origen had, so or the holiness, in my opinion. So um, Tertullian... Um, was an imperfect character, but a great one nonetheless. As we all are. Cyprian of Carthage. You can't fail to mention Cyprian. I have quoted him over and over again through the course of my ministry because he was famous for on the unity of the church. And in that 
volume, he talks about the fact that you can't have God for your father if you don't have the church for your mother, that outside the church there is no salvation because salvation is the church. And in talking about the unity of the church, he uses the illustration, the seamless tunic of Jesus Christ as a symbol for unity. Absolutely. And I think it's important, you know, this idea of the church as mother. For some folks, that's kind of a a different idea. Uh, I don't think you find uh, lots of Christians thinking of the church that way. I think a lot of times people think of the church rather as an institution. And, you know, Cyprian is very clear on the importance of the bishop as the local sign and focal point and instrument of unity. And so he's very strong on the importance of the authority of the bishop. But for him, the church is not primarily an institution. It's primarily a mother. And uh, the baptismal font is the mother's womb through which new children come. So this, I, I love this. I, I, and I think all we need to kind of think about our own model of the church and how we think about the church. But the church is really an organic reality. There's lots of different metaphors for the church. But the primary ones are things like family, mother, and body of Christ, and not so much institution. So we see, yet the institutional dimension is very important to preserve the unity of that family and the the, the connected to its apostolic foundation. So um, I think uh, Cyprian is really an important figure. The Church of North Africa is a very important church. Tertullian was one of the thinkers of that. And, you know, it's fascinating, even though Tertullian seems to have died out of full communion with the church and the bishop of Carthage, the successor to that bishop of Tertullian, uh, Cyprian, still calls Tertullian a master and reads Tertullian regularly. And I, I love this, that, that the church is able to look past the faults of its sons and daughters and, you know, eat the meat and spit out the bones. And that's, that's what uh, Cyprian did when it came to the legacy of Tertullian. And ultimately, St. Cyprian beheaded for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And the story is poignant, it's profound, and, you know, we see modern-day beheadings taking place in the Levant, and we think about so many who were beheaded, beheaded, having their head cut off like John the Baptist in the early church. It is amazing, yeah, and, you know, that was the merciful way to die, by the way. You know, crucifixion was the the shameful way uh, to put a slave to death or a provincial. So a citizen who committed a capital crime would be beheaded. And that's how Justin died. That's how Cyprian died. I think it's beautiful that, uh, you know, the Romans wanted to go after the the heads of the church. They thought that if they could get rid of the leaders, that the the whole movement would die. So they went after the clergy around the year 250. And that's how Cyprian died. And so did at that time, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope also died in that same persecution. But you know, that did not destroy the church. And in fact, that emperor fell into divine judgment. He went into battle in the east against the Parthians and was the only Roman emperor ever to be captured and never be returned by the Parthians. We don't know what happened to him to this day for sure, but we know that his son decided to change his tune and stop persecution. So there was a period of peace under his son that lasted about 40 years for the church. And you talk about the great persecution that begins in AD 303 with the Edict of 303, an edict that prescribed that all Christian buildings were to be destroyed and that sacred scriptures and liturgical vessels should be seized and meetings were forbidden. And then you had a year later all Christian clergy being imprisoned. And yet this was one of those persecutions as great as it was that ended with the Edict of Milan in 313, where you have Christianity actually becoming the faith of the Roman Empire. Yeah, it's a pretty amazing thing, pretty amazing story. It's, it just kind of goes to show the blood of the martyrs really is the seed of the church. When the world persecutes the church, the church becomes more itself, and its witness becomes more compelling and more powerful. And I think, you know, the sacrifice of the martyrs has great intercessory power, calling down the Lord's blessing upon the evangelization efforts of the church. So the irony is the more the Roman government persecuted the church, the more the church grew. And at the time of Constantine, you know, probably 10% of the empire, 
was Christian at that point in time, probably about six million people. Constantine himself had an experience of some kind of vision that led him to trust in Christ's protection in a battle that was decisive and made him the emperor. So the next year after his great victory in Rome at the Milvan Bridge, he declared religious liberty and religious toleration in the empire. And he realized that the government owed the church a lot because it had destroyed its, you know, not people's lives, it destroyed property, seized property, seized the sacred books. So actually the first churches that were built by the government were built in restitution for the injustice of that persecution. And that's where um, the Lateran Basilica in Rome comes from, for example, which was the first church in the West. And to this day is, you know, kind of the mother church of the Western churches in Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've talked about the Apostolic Fathers and the Apologists, probably time to move on to the Nicene Fathers. And in that context, perhaps we ought to talk about the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. This was one of the most important of the seven ecumenical councils. In fact, along with the Council of Constantinople, it codified the singular Christological and Trinitarian truths that we hold to be so dear within the authentic body of Christ today. Absolutely. It, it was called to settle the problem, because as the church emerged from persecution, unfortunately, there were some folks who were teaching something new that uh, was an unsettling the church, and that is that Jesus was incarnate of the Word, but the Word that became flesh in Jesus was not equal to the Father. Instead, it was a creature, God's first creature, through which he creates the rest of the universe. And there was a priest named Arius who taught that. And he was a very clever dude. He's from Alexandria, a very wealthy parish, had a lot of followers. He taught the dock hands along the, the Nile there in Alexandria as the Nile meets the sea. He taught them his theology in song, and they carried it all over the empire to various ports. So it became a real issue. Constantine is now confronted with a problem. He thought the church would help renew Roman society and unify it, and he sees disunity. So he calls the council, and bishops come from all over the East, and a representative of the Bishop of Rome shows up, and they listen to Arius, and they listen to a deacon from Alexandria named Athanasius. <laughs> and they say, no, Arius, this is wrong. We need to emphasize this is absolutely wrong. And they basically take a creed that was prayed at baptism in a local church, and they expand it and clarify that Jesus, that the Word is God from God, light from light. He's true God from true God, and He's begotten, yes, He's the only begotten Son of the Father, but not at a moment in time. He's not made, He's begotten, which means He comes from the Father eternally. And so this is um, very clear, it's very, very clear, and everyone signs it except Arius and two others, and they're exiles. So that's really what happens in the Council of Nicaea, and um, it's the first time that the, all the bishops or representatives of, of all the bishops of the world meet together to deal with a very serious problem that impacts everyone. So it's called an ecumenical council, a council of the whole world, or a council of the whole household, literally, the church being the household of the faith. So um, it's really, really important. That creed is it's a beautiful gift that, that is bequeathed to us that we recite, many of us recite very frequently in our worship services. And so important to us even today because you, know, you think that Arianism would have disappeared, but it hasn't. The Jehovah's Witnesses are the Arians of today. So they believe that God creates Jesus Christ and then Jesus Christ becomes a junior partner in the creation of all other things. So again, these councils, they hammer out these important Trinitarian and Christological truths, which still have incredible import for us in the present. Absolutely. If Christianity is a love relationship between us and God, uh, then we really need to know who God is. And to get that wrong really is very, very serious. 
So it's important, you know, the dogmas of who Jesus is, true God and true man, who, that God is one, one God and three persons, you know, this is really central to understanding who it is we love and who we're called to be, who we are. Since we're made in the image and likeness of God, it's pretty important to know who God is. So uh, this is critical, and it's a great gift that we've received so much clarity from our, our ancestors in the faith, these fathers of the church. And the clarity of your book is absolutely stunning. One of the things that you point out, and it's sort of parenthetical, but so critical, is how heresy arises when people seek to take the mystery or paradox out of the Christian faith. So people become impatient with mystery, and heresy seeks to domesticate paradox or mystery. And I think that's one of the critical errors of the church. We have to live with tension. There's so many things that we can't explain. How do we explain fully how Christ can be one person with two natures, 100% human, 100% divine, or how God can be one in essence and three in person or subject. There's explanations that we give, but ultimately, if we try to rip the paradox or the mystery out of the Christian faith, we denude it, we domesticate it. Yes. God is not like a crossword puzzle that we can solve, and once solved, just put in our back pocket and move on. If we could master God with our intellect, we'd be God. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of, it kind of stands a reason that what you understand fully, what you can master, cannot possibly be God. And heresy always tries to master God and simplify in a certain way. Domesticate, I love that word that you used. I love C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Aslan, who's a figure of Christ. Aslan is not a tame lion. You can't domesticate God and <laughs> fit him in your little categories. So uh, mystery doesn't mean that you can't understand anything about God. It means there's so much to understand that you can never get it completely and fully in your brain. And, and uh, there's always more to explore. That's part of the good news in mystery, that uh, the tension, the paradox uh, means that we can sit before God forever in wonder and we'll never get bored. And I love that about the fathers when they talk about the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of Christmas, they just revel in the paradox. They celebrate it. They ponder it. And uh, that is so energizing and life-giving. That is really uh, the way to go. I love what you just said, because even in eternity, we'll never come to an end of exploring God. He's ineffable. Amen. So there'd be no boredom in the new heavens and the new earth. A hallmark of heresy is to cling to private opinion as opposed to seeing the church as the ground and pillar of truth. And, you know, I think this is one of the big problems in the modern church today. If you look at the broad swath of the church, there's so much private opinion. And, uh, you know, I have to confess that over the years I've fallen prey to that because I have been studying the Word of God for such a long period of time. And I think that I can come to a corner of the truth, but I really can't. I have to test what I believe in light of what the church has always taught. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an issue, again, of humility. That's part of holiness. I mean, honestly, the whole mystery of redemption is a mystery of the humility of God, who leaps from the glory at the right hand of the Father. The Word leaps into the squalor of a stable and, and then humbles himself, as it says in Philippians 2, uh, to not only die, but die the death of a slave, the most shameful death of all. I mean, the, the Lord humbles himself. And actually, I think this is a mystery of what holiness is about. It, arrogance is the antithesis of holiness. And there's a certain arrogance to think, I know better than 2,000 years of the church's heritage, that I have an insight that's brand new that is better than the insights of the fathers and the councils. And, and you know, I mean, there's a certain kind of submission to Christ that expresses itself through submission to Christ's body. And, and I think that's just, just the way it works. So any theologian, and that's what I loved about Origen, Origen was always in submission to the Lord and through the church to the Lord, uh, to the church, because it's, it's Christ's body. And I think that's the posture that all of us should have. And if we have that posture, we're good. I mean, I think we're in good shape. And once we lose that posture, then division happens and pride takes over and lots of bad things happen. I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but it's just too delicious to pass up. Homoousius versus homoi. 
Usius. In other words, you have a little jot or tittle that makes all the difference in the world. And this is one of the things discussed in the councils. Homo Usius is saying that Jesus Christ is of the same essence of the Father. Homo Usius is saying that he's of a similar essence. It's not the same substance, but similar. And that makes all the difference in the world. Yes. The word is either equal to the Father or not. <laughs> you really can't, you know? So it can be a lot like the Father, but not equal, just a little bit, then, then we, we don't have one God, uh, we, and we don't have a divine Savior um, that is equal to the Father. And, you know, one of the things I, I just want to point out here, why is it so important to understand that Jesus is the incarnation of the eternal Word, who is equal to the Father? Well, if Jesus is just a, the incarnation of a creature, then God keeps us at a distance. He sends an emissary that is not equal to him and doesn't really know him fully. The only one who can know God the Father fully is one of the same substance. So Jesus comes, and in coming, it's God coming himself. He is not afraid to enter into our life. He loves us that much, and he sends us, uh, the Father sends us a Redeemer who can fully reveal the Father to us because he has the same mind as the Father. He is one in being with the Father. So, I mean, in terms of knowing that kind of intimacy with the Father, the intimacy with God all hangs on whether Jesus is truly the incarnation of the eternal Word, who He is truly God. Uh, it matters a lot to our salvation and to the, the quality of our relationship with God. So, um, you know, I just think that's important to note. Yeah, absolutely. And deification is at the heart of this because it's the Word, the Logos, who opens to us the way to union with the Godhead. And if the incarnate Word is not the same substance with the Father, if He's not truly God, then our deification is impossible. Again, talking about deification rightly understood, as Athanasius would have spoken about deification. So he understood, and we have to mention Athanasius, no discussion of the voices of the early fathers would be complete if we didn't talk about Athanasius, but he understood the deity of Jesus Christ is the linchpin of our salvation, because if Christ were only a creature, as you've just talked about, the gospel would not be good news. And there was a time in which Athanasius was willing to stand against the world, Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. And he did that at a great cost. Of course, he wrote The Life of Anthony, one of the most popular books of all time. And he was talking about how Arians were no better than pagans because they served the creature rather than serving the creator. He was amazingly courageous and um, he paid the price for it, as, as you said. You know, he uh, was exiled to Trier. I visited Trier about a year ago, and it was so awesome to be there knowing that Athanasius had been in exile there. And he also then he was exiled in Rome, and then he had to run out of the city of Alexandria into the desert and hid out with the monks in the desert, just as trying to escape the emperor. I mean, he, he really, really battled courageously for the truth and writing like guerrilla warfare. He's writing from the desert letters against the Aryans in defense of the Lord's divinity. So uh, he was an amazing character, but you know, he didn't live to see the triumph of Orthodox Christianity. It's kind of sad that at the end of his life, things still didn't look really good. But just a few years later, another council was called and vindicated Nicaea and put Arianism down in a more decisive way. So, you know, like Moses, he, he died without entering into the promised land. He saw it from afar, but he, he wasn't able to enter into it in his own lifetime. And what a great father who formally codified what we now talk about as the New Testament canon. So this happens in 367, and it's many, many years later maybe decades or longer later before the New Testament is actually recognized formally throughout the land, throughout the Christian world as the 27 books. And I think we have to keep driving home that point because we have this idea in our minds that the Bible fell down from Mount Sinai hot off the plates and don't recognize that the Bible was a work in progress. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, yeah, his letters, his pastoral letters that he writes to his people 
are a treasure. And one of the, those letters gives a list of the, the New Testament books that are canonical, which means approved by the church that's, and, and used in the liturgy. He also writes a festal letter uh, about Easter and, and Lent every year, which the, those letters are beautiful. They're a treasure trove just to help us in our devotion during the, the great time of Easter and the holy days that, that are the center of the Christian year. And so I really encourage people, I'd love them to read this book, but I also want to see people actually get into the Fathers. And uh, there's so many editions available of so many of the Fathers. I just mentioned, if you don't mind, Hank, on my website, DrItaly.com, there's a library of Athanasius excerpts and a lot of the excerpts of the, of, you know, more extensive excerpts than, than we have in the book here that are kind of highlights and they're organized by topic. So people can actually search drlee.com and, and go to the library page and see, you know, that the authors, the various fathers and see what they, what they have, but they can also go by topic on Eucharist and see various patristic things written by the fathers over the years on Eucharist or on scripture, uh, on various, on tradition, on various topics like that. So how did you come to be known as Dr. Italy? Well, it's pretty simple, Hank. I have a long name that no one can remember, but they can remember it's Italian, and I'm a professor of theology. They can remember I'm a doctor. So, you know, DrItaly.com works a lot better than MarcellinoD'Ambrosio.com. No one's ever going to get that URL right. Uh, <laughs> That's how it happens. Uh, we're going to have to go with blazing speed over a few more of the fathers. I hate to pass over some of these fathers quickly because they are so transcendently important. The three Cappadocian fathers, Basil the Great and the two Gregories. I mean, how can you not mention them? Yeah, and what's amazing about them uh, that is often forgotten is the beauty of their friendship and their family life. They didn't come out of nowhere. They came out of a fam two families of confessors. You know, they had uh, you know, in their ancestry, now they're living a couple of generations after the persecution's over, but their grandparents uh, were, were confessors and martyrs. Yeah, and so uh, one of the guy's fathers was a bishop. And in the case of Gregory of Nyssa, his brother is Basil the Great, and his sister is St. Macrina. And um, Macrina was probably the strength behind both of her brothers. She, she, was, she was the older sister. She probably helped homeschool them early on, but she definitely chewed Gregory of Nyssa out for being a crybaby about his problems and his exiles and, and told him on her deathbed, he comes to visit her and she's telling him to stand firm and not to complain and to give thanks and to ride tall in the saddle. It's a beautiful little story. He writes a life of Macrina. So, I mean, these guys are all brilliant, amazing theologians, but they're incredible disciples and they're brothers in Christ. And I think that's a beautiful thing to see their communion they're living out of the mystery of the unity of the church and their friendship and support for one another. And Ambrose, he's famous for talking about an understanding of the relationship between church and state, how they should properly interact. And he points out succinctly that the emperor is in the church, but never above the church. Absolutely. He, he chewed out the great Theodosius, Theodosius who made Orthodox Catholic Christianity, the religion of the empire, and did so much good in many ways, he um, committed an atrocity and massacred a town uh, because that town had rioted and killed the, the mayor. And um, Ambrose said, you will not set foot in the church until you've done public penance. If I see you walk into the church, I'm going to stop the, the Eucharist until you leave. And so he could have been, he could have been killed for it. But uh, the, the great Theodosius did public penance and loved Ambrose for the rebuke that he received. And, and the emperor died being comforted by Ambrose, which is a beautiful story of this relationship between these two men. So Ambrose was a very courageous man, but also just an amazing theologian and spiritual father. He was a spiritual father of Augustine. Without Ambrose, there would have been no St. Augustine. Um, and Ambrose is a, is a connector between East and West, one of the few Latin theologians who knew Greek really well and brought the Greek fathers to the knowledge of the West at that time. So just so much wonderful stuff. And my family is D'Ambrosio. We're from Ambrose. So we kind of claim him as a family patron in a special way. Uh -huh. and, and you mentioned Augustine. His, his famous restless heart points us to, uh, to a human creature who remains incomplete, unsteady, stretched, stressed, 
until he realizes union with God. Augustine famously said, God wishes not only to vivify, but to deify us. He was a towering intellect in church history. He wrote uh, between four and five million words. Someone once said, anyone who says he's read all of Augustine lies. So <laughs> <laughs> the volume of his of his teaching on every subject uh, and all of his teaching was, uh, so much of it really flowed from the needs of the church. He was a pastor in a very tumultuous age and had to deal with a lot of different crises, heresies, difficulties. And so in addressing all of those and then feeding people daily in the liturgy through his preaching, he just left us a treasure trove of, of writing uh, that still is such a guiding light to the church today. But really in the West anyway, you know, he, so many of the great Eastern fathers were, were only barely known in the Middle Ages in the West, um, Augustine really helped to keep the church alive and, and learning and growing. He was such a towering figure in the West during those, those difficult years. And then John Chrysostom. I mean, I celebrate the liturgy of John Chrysostom each and every week. And he's born in Antioch, just like Ignatius of Antioch. He's one of the three holy hierarchs of the Orthodox Church. And he's referred to by many in the West as the doctor of the Eucharist. So he is a towering figure in church history as well. He absolutely is. And I think he's one of the most inspiring preachers in the history of Christianity. I love his his Paschal homily, his, his resurrection homily, and uh, I recommend it to people and pass it out every year at this, uh, during this time of Easter. Uh, so uh, I, I really recommend people to, to read. He's, you know, there's some fathers that are harder than others, and, and Chrysostom is primarily a preacher. Um, and so he, he's easy to understand, and he's inspiring, and he has beautiful things to say about marriage and family. So uh, there's a beautiful little volume on Chrysostom on marriage. I think St. Vladimir's Press puts that out. I highly recommend that. Jerome, one of the four greatest teachers of the, the early Western Church, best known for his Latin translation of the Bible, the Vulgate. Yeah, I travel to the Holy Land often, and uh, we always go to Bethlehem. And Jerome has a labyrinth of caves that he lived in and his disciples lived in and, and worked in. Um, he set up shop there and lived right next to Jesus' birth cave and translated much of the Old Testament there, and wrote many commentaries on the prophets there for, let's see, how, how many years was it? Uh, about 35 years he lived there. And so anyway, there's a great statue of him right there next to the Church of the Nativity, and I like to talk about him every year when I take people there, uh, talk about Jerome right in the place where he lived and worked. You also mentioned Leo the Great. His work related directly to the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon, 451. But in perspective of the Council of Chalcedon, there was also a robber council that you write about that took place in 449. Yeah, it was a council that wasn't legitimate and kind of fudged the truth when it comes to Jesus' authentic humanity and divinity, uh, the fact that he has two natures in one person. That kind of was an illegitimate power play on the part of a few bishops. So um, Chalcedon was a legitimate council and Leo wrote a, a letter to that council that was read aloud at the council. And it was seen uh, to be such a clear and concise articulation of the truth of the mystery of Jesus as true God, true man, one person, two natures, um, sharing in our humanity completely, but also sharing in, in the divine nature and possessing that completely. You know, he expressed that so well that after it was read, someone shouted out, Peter has spoken through the mouth of Leo. So uh, it, he is a great uh, doctor of, of, of the humanity and divinity of Christ, very decisive contributor to that council of Chalcedon. Um, and uh, really his sermons on Christmas, on the incarnation, are so wonderful. I have many of those excerpts on my website at drlee.com, and I recommend them at various times throughout the year, but especially at the time of Christmas. Finally, Gregory the Great. I didn't want to leave him out because, as you point out in your book, he was famous for the literal, allegorical, and moral or spiritual models of expounding the text. And so he gave us a sense of how we should do that properly with respect to the books of the Bible, books like the book of Job. Yeah, you know, he was a monk, and personal holiness and appropriating and applying the Word of God to one's life. That was the key focus for him. 
as opposed to articulating objective dogma, you know, and so he really, um, the spiritual sense of scripture, the spiritual appropriation, sometimes it's called the moral sense of scripture, but for him, it wasn't just about moral transformation, it's about spiritual transformation and divinization. That's what he focuses on the most in his commentary on Job, and also his other writings, and uh, I think he's a lot, in, in many ways, like Gregory of Nyssa in the East, in the sense that he was a monk and wanted to lead people into deeper personal holiness. The one thing is, besides being a monk, he became the Bishop of Rome, so he had pastoral responsibilities, of very big ones. And one of the great things that he did was send a group of evangelists, monks as, as evangelizers, to England. Uh, and so the, the Church of England has a very special debt uh, that it owes to Gregory the Great and the monks that brought the life of the gospel there. There were already Christians there before, but they definitely had a very big role in um, evangelizing the whole British Isles area. Maybe you can summarize all of this, this voice of the early fathers, in that you don't find a single father in the early Christian church depicting Sunday worship as a service of singing and preaching. Rather, you see the significance of baptism as a radical, dramatic act of enlightenment, and the chrism as an empowerment, and the Eucharist as the central grace of the church by which Christians partake of the energies of God. And you see that for the early church fathers, the Word of God was paramount. That stands out to me in your book, because somewhere in your book you talk about how in the early church, there are three years of instruction in the Word before someone would be baptized in cases throughout church history, throughout the early church. And you also see this dynamic of the church growing in number in the midst of persecution. The early fathers providing this glorious mosaic of the face of Christ who himself was crucified. What you see, I think, when you look at the, the Church of the Fathers is you see a church that is Catholic and Orthodox, and at the same time evangelical. You really see a focus on the Word of God, on personal conversion, on discipleship. These are, you know, hallmarks of the best of evangelical Christianity. But you also see the centrality of the Eucharist. You see the importance of tradition and authority. These are strong points of, uh, you see the liturgy is central, and not just the Eucharist, but the whole liturgical life of the Church, which is very rich, liturgy of the hours. You see all this stuff, and, and this is, you see that that the church wasn't, you know, one thing or the other. It was all integrated, and it was alive, and that's why it was growing. And I think if we want to grow, we want the church to be alive. We need to recapture the fullness of the great tradition with a capital T that we see expressed in the fathers. And that's why I wrote the book, and why I called it When the Church Was Young. We want to be young in the sense of being alive and having the sense that Jesus Christ, he makes all things new, and he can make our world new today. Our, our, the church should not be receding. We should be moving forward in the re-evangelization of the West and the evangelization of the rest of the world that has not yet heard the gospel. I think that the fathers are key to all of this. When the church was young, voices of the early fathers. This book available for anyone who supports the ministry of the Christian Research Institute. You stand with us prayerfully and financially, stand shoulder to shoulder with us in the battle for life and truth. The book available, you can find it on the web at equip.org. You can order it there, or you can write me at box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, zip code 28271. Do remember to rate and review the Hank Unplugged podcast. And my thanks to Marcellino D'Ambrosio. I don't know if I say that perfectly, but you'd probably have a hard time with my name formally expressed in Dutch. <laughs> but but I, I really appreciate your work. And again, I want to stress to everyone listening in that if you read this book, my son David was the one, you got to read this book, Dad. And he gave me this book. And, you know, I, oh boy, I've read so many of these books. And I started reading this book. I couldn't put it down. And pretty much everyone I give the book to has the exact same experience. So you've done an incredible service to the body of Christ. You're deeply appreciated. Thank you. And I so appreciate you, Hank, and your ministry in the Christian Research Institute. I pray the Lord bless you and really continue to use the Institute to help Christians to grow in understanding and living the truth. And thanks, everybody, for listening in to this edition of Hank Unplugged. 
You know, everybody tells me that when they listen to these podcasts, they want them never end because they're interested not only in my guests, but in the works of my guests. And again, this book, When the Church Was Young, you got to get it. You can find it on the web at equip.org, available for those who support. Hank Unplugged, the Bible Answer Man broadcast, the Christian Research Institute, our YouTube videos, the Bible Answer Man YouTube channel, the many 24-7 outreaches of the Christian Research Institute. My thanks to Dr. Italy and his contributions to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time with more of Hank Unplugged.